In the first video, we talked a little bit about electrical circuits. We talked about the items that compose an electrical circuit, and we talked about the elements that allow the electric circuit to work. So, if you're wondering what we're looking at now, it's kind of a primitive illustration or diagram of the MADAS 125 electric starter circuit. Uh, nevertheless, it is fairly precise. This is kind of exactly what the uh, the wiring schematic shows. Um, but let me give you a little bit of a detour so you can kind of get an understanding of what this whole wiring mess is. Uh, hidden behind my multimeter here is uh, the power source itself, which is our battery. We have our ground side, we have our power side, our positive side. We have our connecting leads going through two switches. The first switch is going to be our clutch switch. If you ever look underneath the perch of your clutch, you're going to see a small little switch with a wire coming in and a wire going out. It's a safety switch, so you don't, it doesn't allow you to, to start the bike in gear or you have to have the clutch in in order to start the bike. From there, the path goes to a push button, uh, push button switch that's going to be on the right side cluster, uh, and that's usually what you push to actually engage the starter. From there, it goes to a starter solenoid, which the star, starter solenoid and all that really is is just a, a big fat switch. And what's happening internally inside the actual starter, it's connecting these two posts together. So when these two posts connect together, the bike will crank over. The other side is going to be our power side. And that too goes through another switch, which is going to be our key ignition switch. So as we turn on our key, we're allowing power to get to the solenoid. So now our path is complete. It always starts at the source and ends at the source. And it follows through some switches and it gets to the component and then we have our power that continues all the way back to the source again. Now, when you go to start up uh, your mad ass, you gotta do a lot of work. I mean, you gotta turn on your ignition switch, the key switch, you have to pull on the clutch, and if everything's working correctly, you push in your starter button and the bike cranks over. But just imagine if you went through all that and you turned on your key switch, you pulled in your clutch, you pushed your button, and nothing happened. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that I have a faulty starter, and that's a logical conclusion. But what if we spend $50 to $75, wait a couple weeks for delivery, spend an hour installing our new starter, and we do the same thing? We turn on the ignition switch, we pull on the clutch, we push the button, and we get the same results. Well, we probably have an electrical issue, and, uh, and it's probably going to be somewhere in a switch or in the wires. Uh, you know, obviously it wasn't the starter. Um, so how do we find out what's happening? Well, this gives us the opportunity to use three types of electrical testing. Uh, we can use our continuity testing to make sure our path is complete that there's no uh, open circuits, there's no interruption in our wires or in our switches to make sure our switches are all operational and to make sure that we're getting power to our solenoid that operates the starter. So when I start to use continuity, well, really any time before I, that I do any type of electrical diagnostic or any type of electrical tracing, I want to get an understanding of what I'm working on. Uh, so generally what I'll do is I want to look at some type of a uh, road map. And roadmap for electricals are, are in the form of elect, what it calls wiring schematics. And we actually have this available for us for free uh, in the forums under the garage section. Uh, I don't know where it is exactly. You just kind of have to fish around for it. But I think it's on page 100. And it has a really good, complete view of the, 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 the directions, the paths that these wires take, the colors of the wires, uh, the switches they go through. And it gives you a really clean understanding. So I strongly encourage for all members that are going to be dealing with any type of electrical issues to really review through that and get familiar with that electrical schematic. There are also troubleshooting charts, uh, value charts. There's all kinds of troubleshooting charts to go through on that where it can really alleviate a lot of headaches, uh, financial uh, issues, and a lot of times you can fix your bike uh, very quickly. If I'm going to check continuity, I don't need really a lot of sophisticated equipment. A lot of times I'll just use a simple little $2 test light. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to test the ground side and I'm going to test the two switches. So I want to connect 
my test lead to the positive side of the battery. I want to test my equipment to make sure it's working and I'll touch that to the negative post of the battery. From the negative post of the battery I'll go to the connector. From the connector I'll go to the first switch which is going to be our clutch switch, the wire going in. If I have good continuity that basically means from uh, switch to ground we're okay. If the light does, if I have no continuity then I know there's a break in the line between the battery connector and to the switch itself and I'm going to trace and I'm going to trace that back and forth, back and forth until I find the breach of continuity, the break in the line, repair it, and continue with my testing. On the other side of the switch, I have no continuity. Why? Because the switch is off. I have to pull in the clutch in, op in order to close the circuit. So as soon as I turn, pull in the clutch, operate the switch, I have good continuity, and I can continue my testing. I go to the push button switch that's on the right hand side of the cluster and I have no continuity. Again, why? Because the circuit is open. We want to close the circuit. We have to push the button and we have good continuity. And we can test this all the way up to the starter solenoid. And this is going to be our ground side. So we have to go through two switches to supply ground to the starter solenoid. Now if I'm going to test the power side, I'm just going to switch my multimeter to the negative side of the battery. Again, test my equipment, my equipment's working, then I go to the connection, the connector from the post of the battery going to the wire. Do we have good, good, good continuity? We can continue. We go to the switch, which is going to be our key switch, and again, we have good continuity. We go to the other side of the switch, we have no continuity. I think you know why, because the circuit is open. We need to turn on the switch to close the circuit, and now we have continuity. We go all the way to the starter, if I can get it in there, and we have good continuity. So now I know my pass is complete from the power source to the solenoid. So now we've, we've reduced our electrical diagnostic to either going with the electrical solenoid itself, or we're going to have to be dealing with the star that we just replaced. Now checking the solenoid, there's really a couple different ways you can check it. The solenoid has a coil inside there. If we want to check the continuity of that coil, we're going to take our multimeter, kind of clear a spot here a little bit because there's not a lot of room, and we're going to take our multimeter and we're going to turn it to continuity. This is not a really good way to test it, but we can at least know that the path of the coil is complete. So all you want to do is you want to connect one side of your, your uh, multimeter pro to one wire, the other to the other wire, we have good continuity. Now if you really want to test that correctly, we, there's always some type of value assigned to your, your uh, solenoid. Again, I don't know what that value is, but we're going to change our multimeter to ohms. We do the same thing, take one probe of your multimeter to one of the wires going in, the other to the other wire going in, and then we watch our multimeter. Okay, so we're about 4.7 ohms, 4.8 ohms. The parameter is probably about 5 ohms, uh, so 4.7, 4.8, that's going to probably be about good. So we know our coil is sound. We'll go ahead and connect our circuit up. The next testing, what I would probably do, if all this is working correctly and my starter is still not working, I probably want to do what they call volt drop testing. This is basically, me, basically trying to find out to make sure the potential, the power source, all my potential from the battery is getting to my component. There's a couple different ways to test it, but when I'm testing starters, well, you know, when I'm testing like lights, there's usually some type of allowance. Um, you know, if I'm running like 12.5 volts, um, if I'm checking a light, you know, I think somewhere around a half volt allowance is okay. Uh, but when I'm checking a starter, something that's requiring like a lot of current, a lot of energy to run through it, uh, I believe they give you an allowance of like a full volt. So we want to get some type of a baseline and we want to turn our system to DC volts. We're checking our power source and we're 12.65 volts. Uh, we're in pretty good shape there. What I would do is I would take 
one of the leads from my multimeter, and again we're on DC volts, and I go directly from the post of the battery directly to the post, the power post of the solenoid. Now remember, this post I'm touching here, it has the direct current, the direct wire going from the, the positive battery to the solenoid. Now, for this to operate, we're going to be at zero volts right now because we have no current flowing. So in order for this to operate, we have to pull in the clutch, turn on the ignition switch, switch, and push the starter button. And right now, we're running about 190 millivolts. So millivolts is nothing. That basically means that we're getting good power. There's no interruption. We're getting good power to the solenoid itself. But... For an example, say if we were climbing up on our chart, we were getting up to like three or four or five volts. Well, we got a problem, and a lot of people would probably think that, hey, you know, I've got a bad cable. And again, that's a logical conclusion, but again, we have to break it down. So from there, if I'm raising up the you know three or four or five volts on my multimeter, I'm going to go from the post to my connector, and I'm going to do the exact same thing again. And right now, I'm dropping. 47 millivolts, nothing, that's pretty good. If I, again, if I was climbing up there, three or four, five, six volts, then I probably have a bad connection between my connector and the battery post itself. Whether it be corrosion, maybe a loose connection, maybe dirt, uh, it would need some type of attention. Clean it, retighten it, retest it. But say if we're, we're looking good, we basically go from our, uh, our battery connector to the wire, we test again. And if we're climbing up on the volts, then we have a problem between the connector and the wire going to the connector. And we do that all the way to the post itself and the connector to the post, the post to the wire. If everything's working good, we do the same thing from this post to the actual post of the starter and do the exact same thing. This is how you can quickly identify if you have an issue. Instead of replacing an expensive uh, starter, waiting a long time, uh, and spending a lot of time working on something that's not going to correct your, your issue. Always do not, try not to condemn the component until you've done the proper testing.